Good morning. We welcome you to worship today at Missouri United Methodist Church. Um, Greg, thank you for a beautiful uh, prelude as always. You know, one of the griefs that I've experienced during this current national health crisis is uh, the singing church. Missouri United Methodist Church is a singing church. I've said often on after or in the middle of a Sunday morning service when I hear all of the voices out here swell and the beautiful instrument that's our pipe organ that leads us in worship that I ought to give my paycheck back and boy have I missed uh, that part of worship every Sunday morning. Um, let me share a few announcements. Uh, related basically to how we can help serve people in need during this critical and difficult time. I can't tell you how many times people at Missouri Methodist have said to me, uh, you know, we're blessed. Um, they, their source of income, largely in this church, people's source of income remains intact. They're able to take care of themselves and their families, but they wonder about other people who are in vastly different situations. And so often the question has come to me, uh, how, can, how can we help? So I have several really practical ways that you can help, and so I want to lift those up to you. These are uh, ways of helping families, people who are experiencing food insecurity and great financial difficulty during this crisis, that, uh, difficulties we may not be personally familiar with. Uh, the month of August, as we mentioned a couple of the last few Sundays, we're collecting funds for this year's Festival of Sharing, and this month we've designated family food boxes as uh, the target items that we want to provide. And rather than collecting the goods, uh, we're trying to gather to $28 each for each of those food boxes, which is the approximate amount of uh, foodstuffs that go into that. And so you can just make a check to Festival of Sharing and put it in the memo section and we'll make sure that it, it gets there. Also, we're partnering with Russell Chapel's uh, Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. They have a community food pantry. And so every, I think it's two Saturdays a month, they distribute food to people in need right here in Columbia, Missouri. And then upcoming projects, the Crop Walk, I checked the website this morning for the Crop Walk. They're still not sure. By the way, this is the 25th year of the Crop Walk here in Columbia, and they are not sure whether they're going to have an in-person walk. If that's allowed, they'll do that. If not, we'll find ways to walk and serve together creatively. Um, but... Um, there are four area ministries that are going to be supported with grants from the Crop Walk this year. These are local ministries, Lowe's and Fishes, which we all are aware of, connected with Wilkes Boulevard, United Methodist Church, serves this whole community. Russell Chapel Food Pantry, uh, Destiny Worship Center Food Pantry and, Pan Pantry, and Fifth Street Christian Church that provides emergency uh, food supplies for families in need uh, in this community. So. And then finally, um, this year, assuming we raise enough funds, we will have the 15th year, I think it is, Cleo, of providing an ARC for Heifer Project. Is that correct? I think we... Okay, great. So uh, the Seekers class, I understand, as they did last year, are going to try to take the lead in raising funds for an ARC. $5,000 provides... Uh, critical help uh, in helping families help themselves around the world. And so they're going to take the lead, but if there's another small group or Sunday school class or whatever, a circle or something that wants to help with that, or just individual donations to the Heifer Project, we'll get those um, sent along too. So those are some very practical ways your second mile uh, generosity and giving can express not only your thankfulness to God for your blessings, but serve people in need too. So keep those in mind. Let's uh, prepare our hearts to be together in worship this morning. As you are able, and join me in the call to worship. In the storms of life, God is our shelter. In the whirlwind of anxiety and concern, God is our secure center. In the flood of tempting images and seductive words, God is a rock of stillness on which to stand. In the avalanche of fears and tears, God is our strong fortress. In all the days of our lives, let God's praise be on our lips. Please be seated as we sing in our hearts our opening hymn, O Day of Rest and Gladness. The lyrics will be on the screen. 
Will you stand as, as, you, as able um, for our unison prayer? A point of personal privilege before we start our prayer this morning. I was in a meeting this week with a public official, and before that meeting started, one of the uh, other people in the meeting looked at that person and said, my wife asked me to tell you that she prays for you every day. And it was just this kind of moment of silence, um, and it was obviously so meaningful to this person. So as we go through our week, let's remember those people, but let's also remember Fred and our staff here. And maybe even send him a note that we are praying for them because this, while we are blessed, as Fred has said this morning, this has been a very difficult time for them. So please remember them as well. Please join me in the unison prayer. Oh Lord, we come to you today as a praying people some of us come asking for your acceptance because we feel alone. Sorry. Some of us come asking for your forgiveness because we feel guilty and compromised. Some of us come asking for your truth because we are confused. Some of us come asking for a challenge because we feel useless. All of us come asking for a sense of your presence because we have come here to meet with you so be with us and among us through the awesome power of your Holy Spirit amen please be seated our scripture this morning comes from Luke chapter 18 verses 1 through 8 and I'm reading from the New Living Translation one day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. 
Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? This is the word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you today for the presence of your Holy Spirit in our midst, in this very sanctuary, and indeed in our lives. Speak to us through your word today so that we may respond with faithful, loving service in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I appreciate your comments about the, that uh, assurance that somebody was praying for someone else meant so much to them. It, it uh, tags in very well with the theme of our message today, which happens to be on prayer. Uh, we've been in a summer series called God Revealed in the Stories of Jesus, and we've been saying every week that there's something significant and meaningful about the character of God that Jesus shares with us in each of his stories. And this morning, uh, in this parable, Jesus tells us about the God who wants, who really wants and desires to answer our prayers. This week, while studying the scripture lesson in preparation for the message, I came across the simple eloquence of a self-educated country preacher who summarized the essential lesson of this parable in this manner. He said, Jesus told this story about prayer so that we would take hold, hold on, and never let go. Now, evidently, Luke agrees with that country preacher Because at the very outset, and this is really important in understanding this parable, at the very outset in verse 1, he says that Jesus told this story so that we would, and hear these words, always pray and not lose heart, not grow faint or weary. So that tells us that there's something in this story that's meant to greatly encourage us in our prayer lives so that we will take hold, hold on, and never let go. And so let's find out what that something is. So Jesus' story has three characters, or three main characters. The first character is a widow. Now, it's important to understand this is not a Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis kind of widow. And by that I mean this is not someone who was wealthy, not someone who was highly educated probably, not someone who was well-connected. And we know that because in Jesus' day, the very word widow was Bible speak, if you will, for someone who was poor and someone who was uneducated and someone who was unemployed or devoid of any power or any status or any connection. That's just what you would have read into this as Jesus used that word widow. In first century storytelling, the proverbial nameless widow, and they were always nameless, by the way, Uh, would be the rough equivalent of a term that we have used sometimes called a bag lady. You know, you see somebody out on the street seemingly, you know, uh, uh, rummaging for for basic survival, and that's what this term would have have, uh, brought to mind for the hearers of this story from Jesus. In other words, so you don't miss the point, a widow in the first century was most likely an unfortunate, dependent, societal outcast. One of those many forgotten and nameless, uh, unheard voices. And we have many of them today, unfortunately. And then the second character in Jesus' story is a local villain. Now, we're not told exactly how, but this man was harassing this woman somehow. Perhaps he was threatening her physically or attempting to exploit her in some way or intimidating her with threats of possible harm. But regardless, this local villain is working over this poor woman who has no real means to protect herself. She has no money, she has no status, she has no connections, nowhere seemingly to turn for help. And then there's a third main character in Jesus' story, and this is an unjust This is important, an unjust and an indifferent local judge. 
Now, I want you to notice Jesus' description of this judge. He's very specific. No fear of God. No respect for his fellow citizens. No sense of accountability for his own decisions and his own behavior and his own actions. And he basically abuses and uses people in his courtroom as he pleases. That's the sense you get as Jesus tells the story. People in his courtroom are nothing more than interruptions and problems and headaches and hassles nothing more. And that's when we meet this poor widow in the story. As Jesus pulls all of this together, we focus in on her and we want to shout, lady, don't even bother walking into this guy's courtroom. Don't even waste your time. And just as we'd expect, the judge laughs in her face uh, and throws her back out onto the streets without any real justice being served. So this judge never even heard, evidently, her pleas for help. This widow simply couldn't reach his heart or move him to action. But now the plot thickens in Jesus' story because she has no other options. And because of that, uh, she has no one to protect her, no power to wield, no money to flash around, no connections to tap. So she decides to pester him until he breaks. And essentially, she says, I'm going to be on him like the robe on his back. I'll be in his face every time he turns around. At every turn, he'll see me. It kind of reminds you of Sting and the police and their famous song that says, every breath you take, every move you make, every bond you break, every step you take, I'll be watching you. That's what she decided to do. I'm going to create some sort of action, she said, one way or the other. Either he'll offer me the protection I seek or he'll put cement slippers on my feet and take me for a dip in the river. I mean, she didn't know what he would do, but she was going to move him to some kind of action. He's my only hope, she reasoned. And so this poor widow is so persistent that she finally badgers this evil judge into submission. And so finally he walks out of his office and he shouts to his subordinates, I just can't take it anymore. She's driving me crazy. Fix this lady's problem. Do whatever she wants and do it now. How's that for a story? At long last, the widow gets justice and the protection she needs. So this is, if Jesus told this parable so that we would not lose heart, so that we would not grow weary or faint, Let me ask you, what's the essential message in this story? How does this story, is this story supposed to function in that way for us? What is the kernel of truth that we're supposed to take away from this parable from Jesus? Is it that we have to wear God down and break God's will before our prayers are answered? Is that the message? Is the message in this parable, it pays to pester? Is that what we're supposed to learn here? I don't think so, not at all. In fact, the very notion of having to pester God is foolish. I mean, wouldn't that be a truly inadequate expression of not only prayer, but of faith in a loving God? Now remember, the parables were usually um, there to present some kind of either comparison or contrast. In fact, the word parable The literal meaning of parable means to throw alongside. As you you tell a story, to throw it alongside and illustrate some truth. But again, the parables work by either comparison or contrast. And in this parable, Jesus is clearly working with stark contrasts. And let me explain. You see, we are not penniless, powerless without status, without connections in God's kingdom, in God's family. God is not too busy. God is not too unjust. God is not too preoccupied or too indifferent, too selfish to answer our prayers. God is better than that. Prayer is not a battle of wills. It is not about competing for God's attention and overcoming God's reluctance. Rather, it is all about understanding God's gracious and loving plans for us and our world and getting in on that. We don't have to wear God down or wrench blessings from God's tightly clenched hands. 
We don't have to pound or pester our way into God's presence. In short, Jesus is telling us we are nothing like this helpless widow, standing before God with no weapon but our stubborn persistence. In fact, when we truly come to understand the nature of our relationship with God, we see just how much we are totally unlike this nameless widow in Jesus' story. She's just a face, just another problem, just another noisy nuisance to this judge. But we are heirs. We are sheep who are called by name. We are children of a loving God. She was abandoned, and we have been adopted gloriously into God's own family. She was a lonely, forgotten outcast. But with God, we are always a priority. And so here's the point. I believe this is the point that is supposed to greatly encourage us in our prayer life, as as Luke says, was the purpose of this story from Jesus. Here's the point. We should never, you should never think of yourself as a penniless, powerless, faceless, forgotten somebody when you pray. You are in the family of God. You are connected to the very author of love and life. You matter supremely to God. Um, I happen to be one of the closet Cub fans here, along with Beverly Huckabee and just a few more. Beverly actually gave me a Cubs hoodie from their championship season that I have in the office. I haven't been bold enough to wear it out here yet among Cardinal and Royal fans. But in Wrigley Field, written on the top of the dugout, so that everyone in the stands can see it, some of you are familiar with this, it says, Welcome to the Friendly confines. Welcome to the friendly confines. Speaking of Wrigley Field, folks as members of the family of God know that as you pray for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done in your life and on this earth, a prayer we need to be praying every day in the midst of the difficulties and, uh, that we face today, you are always in friendly confines. God is in partnership with you, in league with you, never set against you as you seek for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done. Maybe a helpful image. I have a college, a colleague rather, in ministry who pastors this huge church in the, a mega church in the Chicago area. Met him, wow, 40 years ago when I was in my first appointment at a little church called Roscoe Street, just down the street from Wrigley Field, in fact. And uh, there are many demands that are put on his personal time and his resources, but his church leaders insisted that he have a private cell phone, a private line, and a number that's only available for his wife and his children, his close family. And my friend said that when his kids call, sometimes they call to simply say, hi, Dad. Nothing more than that. On a few occasions, he's received phone calls on that special line because of some emergency or some crisis in his family. But the point is that his family can reach him at any time, anywhere, for anything. And my friend says that whenever that phone rings, he knows that he is going to hear the sweet voice of either his wife or one of his children, and there are no voices sweeter than those. When the phone rings, he knows the people on the other end of the line are an absolute priority to him. And that's precisely what Jesus is teaching us in this parable, that God loves to hear our voice. We serve a God who wants to answer our prayers, who wants to partner with us. You may think that God is so busy managing the universe and so preoccupied with major concerns that your prayers are going to be brushed aside. But Jesus wants us to know that nothing in the cosmos is more important than your prayers and your joys and your concerns and your pain and your hopeful longings, your desires. Now, we probably ought to add here that prayer is in fact a partnership. I mean, we obviously trust in God's power and God's purposes, and this teaching from Jesus greatly encourages us in our prayer life. But let us all be reminded that we give hands and we give feet to our prayers through our faithful action, through our work, through our witness in the world. Prayer doesn't absolve us of the responsibility to act. 
Rather, it emboldens us with confidence knowing that God is with us. Can I suggest that the same sun that holds the planets in orbit in our solar system will ripen a single cluster of grapes as if it had nothing else to do? And sometimes we are duped into thinking that God is no more than this distant, aloof, unmoved creator. This God, however, has invited us into a meaningful and rich relationship. It is God's faithfulness, and it is God's desire to be in relationship with us that's the taproot of our Christian hope. So here's what I want to say. Never, ever tiptoe into God's presence thinking of yourself as a poor widow, as a penniless beggar. You are God's child. And you never utter a prayer that doesn't become an immediate priority on God's agenda. Ultimately, God cares about your prayers because God cares about you. And it doesn't get any better than that. Amen.
to use the language in that beautiful hymn as we come to the garden of prayer together today, I I ask that you take this story and this teaching from Jesus uh, seriously, and that you do so by remembering that as we come to this time of prayer, we don't have to twist the arm of a reluctant God to seek good things for this world, nor do we have to find ways to persuade a distant God to come near to us today. So let us remember as we pray, we kneel alongside Jesus Christ in the presence of a listening God with the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. O listening God, your Son and our Lord has taught us to pray and to never lose heart. But frankly, there are times when we feel worn down and faint-hearted. We often feel weary, we lose hope, and are close to giving up. And in times like these, we need to hold each other up in prayer, encourage each other, be there for each other. So we bring to mind now those who are in need of our prayers and your help, those who are ill and anxious, those who are lonely and sad, those who are despairing and defeated, those who are hungry, homeless, hopeless, those whose relationships are strained and breaking apart, those who are bullied and abused, those who cannot find work, and those who are overworked. In silence now, we make our own specific prayers for those who are on our hearts and minds today. Oh God, we also celebrate all those who persist in the cause of right, who will not keep quiet, who insist on raising the issues again and again, who campaign for unpopular causes, write letters, send emails, sign petitions, people who pick up their pens, lend their voices, take to the streets to speak up and stand up with stubbornness and courage to change this world. Give them the continued grace and sustained strength that comes only from you. We offer this prayer in the presence of God alongside Jesus Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit, committed to going into this week to live out our prayers through our own lives. And all of this we bring to you in the name of our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as I said each Sunday, uh, I continue to be encouraged and um, thankful for the faithfulness of this congregation in giving. And so I'm aware that people give while they're here on Sunday mornings, clearly. The offering plates are here so that uh, either during the offertory, um, music provided by Craig, or as you exit or as you come into the building, you can do that. Clearly, some people who are not here are finding their own ways to continue giving online and in other ways, sending in their gifts. And so thank you for those resources that keep Missouri United Methodist Church uh, strong and able to be uh, who we are and do what we we do. So in that spirit, let's receive with great thankfulness uh, these gifts today.
source of all that is good and holy, we come with gifts in response to your great love. You pour out your goodness. We bring you thanksgiving. You infuse us with your power. We offer the fruits of our labor. You sustain us with strength. All that we do, we dedicate to your purposes and your glory. Honor and bless these endeavors, which are a testimony to your abiding grace. Amen. Those of you who are gathered here for worship today and for others wherever you are, receive this blessing. May you continually wrestle with prayer. May you knock on the door of heaven with shameless boldness. May your prayers produce in you a countenance of joy and unshakable confidence born of faith. And may the God of hope fill you with grace that you may abound in hope, assured that your prayers are heard by a loving and gracious God. Go in peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.